elder for the comprehensive prayer. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Before I give over to uh, Pastor uh, Pastor Ueda Simangani, Pastor Ueda Simangani, as we said yesterday, he has been, the family is blessed with a baby daughter. Her name is Renesete, uh, meaning uh, Lady Grey. So thank you so much, Muruti. May God be with you once again. Uh, God bless you. Over to you, Mkundis. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, Tabo. And uh, thank you for that first prayer, Elder. We want to greet you, beloved sons and daughters of the living God, in the name of our brother, Jesus Christ. It is an honor to join you once again this morning. And I pray that God's spirit will truly be with us, that we will be blessed as we meditate upon his word. I want to draw our message for this morning from a couple of texts of scripture. Uh, allow me to just list a few verses. I will just read them briefly in their summarized formats. Genesis chapter 25, verse 34. So Esau despised his birthright. Luke chapter 3, verse 38. Adam, the son of God. And uh, Luke chapter 15. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. Father in heaven, we ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit. May you inspire us, may you encourage us, may you transform us. For we ask humbly in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, beloved we notice very quickly in the book of Luke that Adam is given a very honored position, a very special place in the human family. Everyone else in the genealogy of Jesus has a human father. You remember this. Adam is the only one referenced as having a heavenly father. He is the only one referred to as the son of God. Now they say familiarity breeds contempt and I want to begin by establishing how special a position this is. Uh, there is only one time that you can have this honor. Uh, to be the son of God is only referenced as it were one time. Uh, he is the firstborn son of humanity, and that is something that could only have happened once. Uh, but I want you to understand this morning that as you look at the Bible, though we might be familiar in the New Testament with uh, the concept of being sons and daughters of God, uh, this was a uh, a very sharp transition from what had been known in uh, the Abrahamic faith. I have yet to find in the Old Testament an individual in the human family who is referred to as a son of God or one who uh, called God father. Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, or Daniel never fell to their knees in the solitude of their chambers and dared to address God that way. It was therefore a very radical uh, thing when Jesus again and again refers to himself as the son of God and refers to God as father. But before Christ, Adam is the son of God. 
And I want you to remember this for coming days that these two seem to hold a very special position in the human family. That Adam is the son of God, the first one to be re referred to as such. And until Christ, the only one to be referred to as such. And when Christ comes, he refers to God as his father. Now, as a son, Adam had access to the tree of life. As a son, he had access to the throne of God. He had dominion over the earth. He was an image of God on earth, an ambassador of God. This was, as it were, if it was a business, you would call it father and son's cooperation. It was Adam representing God on earth. The rulership over God's creation had been handed over to Adam so that he would do so on behalf of his father. Uh, but Adam was found unfaithful in God's house and his status and privileges were revoked. Uh, and this happens when an intruder, an invader, an imposter, a thief and uh, interloper uh, appears and claims his position. It is as though at the tree of life, at the tree rather of the knowledge of good and evil, our first parents put an X on the paper and effectually sold what was theirs by right of birth. They entered into a negotiation there under that tree with a liar and a deceiver, and they found themselves empty-handed after the deal. Uh, the forked tongue serpent deceived them. He lied to them. He advertised heaven, but gave them hell. He promised pleasure, but gave them pain. It ended in tears. And here we are at the end of that decision, on the other side of that decision. And we can know without a doubt that decisions have consequences. Two arrangements must be understood as we look at this story. As we look at this story, I want us to go to another story to appreciate what is happening here. Because when this decision is made, it is a decision that alienates Adam from his father. We can already begin to see in chapter three when Adam hides from God. You see, it is not God that hides himself, but Adam hides himself, runs away from God. Sin drives Adam away from God. And God is the one that comes towards Adam. He's the one that seeks pro uh, proximity to Adam. But uh, sin has separated those that were intimately connected one with another. That is the effect of sin. I, I must also maybe pause here if I promise to keep the engine running and say that uh, sin is something common to all of us. It is a problem that we all possess. There's a story given of a pastor who saw children playing on the street. And the pastor runs to them and he listens to them speaking and he loves children as pastors do. And as he listens to them, there is one that is a ringleader among them. And the ringleader is uttering words that shock the pastor. He says, whoever can tell the biggest lie, I will give this puppy. And the pastor looks and there's a puppy tied to a pole on the side of the street. Whoever can tell the biggest lie, I will give this puppy. And of course, the, pup, the pastor sees a teachable moment right there. And he comes along and he says, oh, this is not a good game to play. And then the, the, the children come and they no, pastor, this is just a game. We're just playing a game. Uh, you know, not, he says, this game is teaching you bad habits. It's uh, encouraging lies. And uh, no, pastor, it's just a game. And uh, the pastor thought, okay, let me use this moment to... Uh, give instruction to the kids. And the pastor says to them, you see, when I was a kid, I never lied. Uh, to which the kids, the ringleader's eyes popped open and he immediately went to the side of the pole and untied that little dog, that little puppy and gave it to the pastor. Game over. Who can compete with the pastor? Whoever can tell the biggest lie, <laughs> I will give this puppy. The pastor has won.
Even when trying to do what is right, the pastor finds himself going astray. We find ourselves in this predicament that sin has gotten a hold of us. Sin has gotten the better of us that though we hold desires in our hearts to do right. Paul says, that which I want to do, I do not do. That which I do not want to do, I find myself doing. This is a problem. Why is it a problem? It is because choices have consequences. And though we might not uh, choose what the consequences are, we do make the choices and those choices will come with consequences. And so you may choose and make your decisions and that is up to you, but it is not up to you what the consequences shall be. And so, beloved, this is what we see in the Bible story, that choices are made and those choices have consequences. It might seem like a very light choice that is made there under that tree. It seems like a light choice, doesn't it, when uh, there is a fruit and that fruit is eaten. How could it be that at the end of that simple choice, at the end of that minute appearing choice, that we have this avalanche of consequences? How could it be? I want to give an illustration to the gentlemen that are here among us. If, if you are standing and a woman comes to you, a stranger, a lady comes to you and says, uh, look to your left, and as she gives that instruction, your wife comes along and says, no, look to the right. I want to promise you, it really does not matter the value or the reasons for looking to the left or the right. At the moment when one woman says, look left, and your wife says, look right, the right decision, my brother, is to look right. Uh, forget about whatever rationalizations you may have. Forget about what lies on the left or what lies on the right. At that moment, it is a question of allegiance. At that moment, it is who you are choosing. Uh, the, the result of that choice may go further than whatever weight you put to the choice itself. At that moment, you are choosing size. When your wife says, look right, it is a choice whether you are choosing another woman when you choose left. And so it is not simple simply a matter that you've chosen left. It is a matter that you've chosen another woman over your wife. I want to suggest, beloved, that when our first parents are sitting by the tree and God has said, look right, and another comes and he says, look left. It was a decision of alliances that was being made. It was a decision of which side you are on that was being made. And this is why this is such a weighty decision. It's not just about a fruit. It is not just about uh, glancing left or glancing right. It is about whose side are you on? And I want to suggest that at that moment, they chose the wrong side and they were deceived, though he promised a heaven, this deceiver gave them hell and we are experiencing it right now. Decisions have consequences. They at that moment had a birthright, but in making that choice, they forfeited the birthright. In making that choice, they sold the birthright for a fruit on a tree. And you might think that no, this cannot be. But the Bible gives us illustrations again and again of how this happens, of how you can, as a child, as a firstborn son, uh, give away your rights to be a son, your rights to be a firstborn son, together with the inheritance that comes with it. How so, Pastor? Well, let's go to the family of God in the Old Testament. There we have Abraham. Abraham is given a covenant, and this covenant comes with blessings. It is a covenant that comes with promise. It is a covenant that comes with a future that drives even unto eternity because Abraham was blessed and through him the families of the world will be blessed. And so it was from generation after generation from his own loins everyone that came after him would come in the context of this covenant. And so what is it that happens there is a law of a firstborn son and so uh, Abraham's firstborn son was to be the inheritor of the covenant and the covenant's blessing what does this mean it means that that which Abraham was his firstborn son would be he would take the status of Abraham he would be the father of his household he would be the heir of this status of being the father 
He would be the heir of the status of being the ruler, of being the high priest of his household. He would be the heir of this covenant of being the one through whom the blessing would come. And so the lineage through which Jesus would come would come through the one who inherits this covenant blessing. But this could be forfeited. This birthright could be sold. And this birthright could be decided to be handed over to another. And we see this very clearly. Uh, that um, it simply was not a matter of who came that had to be fulfilled and so Ishmael comes and Ishmael does not get the birthright because he did not come as a child of promise it is Isaac that comes as a child of promise watch what happens when Isaac comes Isaac receives the covenant blessing Isaac receives the status that Abraham had and Isaac transfers that status to his own firstborn son but I want you to notice something here that Ishmael receives a blessing and Isaac receives the birthright but but the birthright comes with a blessing. I hope you're following me here today because this is important to understand what is happening between Adam and Jesus Christ. And so now the son of Abraham is Isaac who receives the, the status and Ishmael who receives a blessing. But Isaac also has children and Isaac's children are Jacob and Esau. Esau comes first, but Esau, the Bible says, despised his birthright. His birthright was that he would take the status through Esau. The lineage of Jesus would be through Esau. The covenant blessing would flow, but Esau despised the birthright. And he would rather have the blessing. The Bible tells us that though he sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for a bowl of soup, at the end of the story, when his father Isaac is giving the blessings, he comes along and he says, give me the blessing. But his father says, no, 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 I've already given the I've already given Jacob the blessing, the greater blessing. I cannot undo that. And so we see here that he says, I will bless you nonetheless. And so a blessing is given, but the birthright stays with Jacob. And that is why Jacob is the one through whom the heritage flows, through whom the covenant blessing flows. He has sons and he blesses all his sons. But this blessing is different from the birthright because his firstborn son forfeits the birthright. He he does an egregious thing, Reuben does, and the birthright is forfeited, and Jacob, Israel, gives the blessing, gives the covenant birthright uh, promise to, jo to Joseph's son. And you can see right here what is going on. There is a blessing on the one side, and there is a birthright on the other side. The birthright that comes uh, with the covenant is a birthright that comes with greater blessing, but there are blessings that come also. Now, there is a deception in the mind of Esau. Esau simply wants a blessing. And we spoke yesterday about blessings, that we are blessed. The first thing that God does is bless us, but there's something that comes with being a firstborn son that does not happen to everybody else. The firstborn son inherits something, a status that others cannot possess. And so this is what happens when uh, Esau sells his birthright. He sells so much more. And when he now decides to get the blessing that he initially wanted, he cannot get a high blessing, even as he, Jacob got the blessing. Beloved, I want to close here, but I hope you've understood what we are saying here. There is something to be differentiated. The blessing is the providences of God, as it were, and the birthright is the responsibilities that come with a particular status. And so there are responsibilities that come with the birthright. When you got the birthright, you had to, you couldn't just marry anyone. When you got the birthright, uh, you had a certain responsibility as a priest of the entire household. When you got the birthright, you were an image of the father in heaven. When you got the birthright, you were governed in a way that others were not governed. Esau did not want such responsibilities. He only wanted the blessing, but in being deceived to only want the 
blessing, he manifested this by the bowl of soup. When he says, give me the soup and I do not want anything to do with the birthright, that was symbolic of the kind of mentality that he has. I want to say, may God dispel the mentality that wants a blessing without the responsibility. May God dispel uh, this mentality that wants the provisions without the, 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 without the purpose. May God dispel this idea that we can be able simply to eat a fruit on a tree and not deal with the consequences. There is a responsibility when you, beloved, are a child of God and you can forfeit that which is already yours in the Father. And this is exactly what happens. Adam forfeits what is his. And in forfeiting what is his, he plunges all humanity into darkness. In forfeiting what is his, all humanity loses the entire inheritance. We lose what is already given us, the earth that is ours, the dominion that is ours. All of it is gone. And what do we see? By the time we come to the book of Job, we see that when Adam shall be the head of the household, when the sons of God are called to God's presence to give an account from the places and the households of God, Adam is not the one representing us. There is another who comes and God says, where are you coming from? And this one says, I'm coming from earth, from gallivanting here and there. And he is making himself appear to be the head of this household. Yes, indeed. By the time Jesus comes, he refers to this imposter as the ruler of this world. Could it be that Satan at this point, when uh, at the tree, he deceived Adam and Eve, when they fell, that he takes their position as a ruler of this world. He takes their position as a king of this world, as it were. And then we are plunged into a huge problem when Adam and Eve forfeit that which God had given them. I want to say today, beloved, that we find ourselves in a huge, huge mess because we have forfeited the birthright. We have forfeited and sold for a fruit on a tree the entire blessings of God. And we have been left with egg in our faces. Uh, I want to say to you that, beloved, as we make decisions in this life, our decisions have eternal consequences. It is not just our first parents that made eternal weighty decisions. We too are making decisions. And today I want us to pause and to understand that as children of God, we cannot leave anyhow. We cannot simply do anything. We cannot be anybody because we've been given a responsibility in as much as we've been given a blessing. We've been given purpose in as much as we have been given provision. And I pray today that as God blesses you, he will also give you a sense of responsibility in his household, that you will always be aligned with the Father, make choices aligned with God, that you would understand that the decisions you make today will have consequences for generations to come. Africa, don't sell your land for a bowl of soup. Fathers, don't sell your children's future for an emergency today. Mothers, please consider how weighty your decisions are and that they will affect generations to come. May the Lord bless us as today we live our lives as children, as sons and daughters of the living God. Father in heaven, we want to ask for forgiveness for our sins and we want to thank you. We want to thank you that you have a purpose for us. Today, I pray that you may, like David prayed, search our hearts. And if there be any wicked way in us, may you reveal it so that we do not sell our birthright for a bowl of soup. May you reveal our own sinfulness and our own darknesses, our biases, our own rebellion to us so that, Father, we do not uh, self-sabotage, so that we do not put ourselves in positions where we forfeit even the blessings of God himself. Father, I present every child, every son and daughter into your hands, and I pray that you may forgive them for their sins, but today fill them with your Holy Spirit to live a holy life. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.